1st of August, our church commemorates the seven heroic children during the second century, during the Alexandrine period, the seven Maccabees. Who are the seven Maccabees? They're not the seven sleepers of Ephesus. They were Christians. But the seven Maccabees suffered a martyrdom equated to the Christian martyrdoms of the first three centuries. They lived during the time of the Alexandrine period, as I said, during the time of Antiochus the Epiphanes, who was the king at the time, but he was not at the stature of uh, Alexander the Great. Alexander came to Jerusalem about 150 years before that. And when he saw the archpriest and the other people coming to meet him at the walls of the city, he got off his horse and he prostrated himself in front of the archpriest. And his general Parmenion said, Alexander, what is wrong with you? Why are you never got off your horse for anybody? Why for this priest? And he said, if you only knew what, what I saw in a dream a few days ago, you would also get off your horse and prostrate in front of this priest. Because I saw someone like him in my dream, dressed like him, who told me, Alexander, I will be with you. Don't harm Jerusalem. I will instruct the priest to give you the keys of the city. And I will be with you and I will hand the Persians. I will deliver the Persians over to you. I was teaching in Virginia last week and I told the catechumens there that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Christ before the incarnation. And here, Christ appeared to Alexander and told him, you will be protected by me and I will hand the Persians over to you. So when he went to Jerusalem, he prostrated in front of the priest because Christ looked in the form of the priest. He was dressed like the priest in his dream. And after he saw this, and after he would hear the prophecies in the temple of Solomon, that would give so much strength to Alexander, who was very young. He died 33 years old, and in 12 years, he conquered the whole world. So the whole procession opened Jerusalem up for Alexander, and for the first time, the priest took him inside the temple of Solomon. This was not permitted for anyone who was a Gentile. But God also instructed the priest at the time, the archpriest in Jerusalem, Jarwa, and he told him that this man is one of my people and don't be afraid of him. So he takes him in the temple in Jerusalem and he sacrificed to the true God of the Jews. Now afterwards, Alexander also wanted to put his statue inside the temple. And the priest told him, please, no, we don't do that for anyone. We don't allow any statues in our temple. And Alexander respected this. And to honor Alexander, the priest told, he told him that because of you, we will name every child that's born this year in Jerusalem, his name will be Alexander. But 150 years later, the successors of Alexander were very arrogant. They were not as faithful, especially Antiochus the Epiphanes, who became a great persecutor of the true people of God at the time, who were the Jews. He wanted to Hellenize the whole area. And of course, this was also the plan of Alexander. It was the plan of God to have Alexander spread the Greek philosophy and also the Greek language all over the world so the New Testament would be written in the Greek language. The Greek language was the main language during that era. 
And many of the Jews spoke Greek, the, uh, the Jews of diaspora. But also many of the Jews were beginning to follow the practices of the Hellenists at the time. They were influenced by idolatry. Again, Alexander was respectful of the religion of the Jews, but Antiochus wanted to change them by force. He wanted to force them to give up their customs. So he began to persecute and kill people if they circumcised their children. As a matter of fact, they took mothers, hung the children around their neck and threw them over their walls. They began a fierce persecution against the people of God. They built a gymnasium in Jerusalem. Now, there's nothing wrong with a gymnasium, but a gymnasium back then was offered to one of the 12 gods of Olympus. And also, all those men in there were totally naked. So a gymnasium was against the religion of the pious Jews. So unfortunately, a high percentage of the Jews who were not very well informed about their faith, they began to change and become Hellenized. They became secularized. And I'm saying all this because the same thing happened to us. In the last 30, 40 years, our country in Greece is unrecognizable. Only 5% of the people go to church. Very few people go to church, many atheists. And the same thing was happening to the Jews, again, second century before Christ. When the true faith of God was in danger, or most of the people were becoming Hellenized, secularized, they were losing the tradition of their fathers. And the purpose of Israel was, was to stay faithful to the faith so they would bring the Panagia and Christ. They were ready to lose all this tradition. So at this very moment, the Maccabees, a very pious remnant of people, the zealots, those who wanted to defend the law of Moses, they rose up and they fought on Diohos and the Greeks who wanted to Hellenize them and destroy their faith and make them idolaters. So this priest called Marathias, he pulled together an army, thousands of people, and they fought the Greeks from the mountains. And they went and destroyed a lot of the idols in the land. And the persecution got so much worse that now Antiochus was telling that anyone who doesn't eat pork will be put to death. So at that moment, he apprehended a number of Jews and among them, these seven children, seven boys, one more beautiful than the other. The youngest one, 11 years old, 11, probably up to 20, 25, and their mother, Solomon. So in front of many people, he told them, look, I'm going to torture you. Look at all those tools that I have, catapults and braziers and cauldrons and tar. And I'm going to burn you and I'm going to cut you from limb to limb. You better eat pork. So he calls the oldest one. Actually, he first called their teacher, Eleazar, who was probably in his 60s, white hair. And he said, look, be sensible. What is wrong with you? God gave us this animal and the meat is very tasty. Just have some pork chops. But this was against the law of Moses. And he says, I will use my faith and my reason and I will overcome all your tortures. And he, be he began to torture the old man, Eleazar, breaking his limbs, breaking his toes, burning him and throwing him in a fire. And then after this, he started bringing along each one of those boys with their mother standing there, their mother standing in front of them. And one after the other, they refused to bow down to the demands of the tyrant. And they refused to break the law of Moses. Because once you break one commandment, you will break the next. And then you will break the next. And then you lose it all. Just like St. James says, if you break one commandment, one law, you break them all. It's amazing the kind of revelation that God revealed to them. The words that they were saying to Antiochus, to the tyrant, was very arrogant. They were telling him, you can cut our limbs. But guess what? God is going to give these back to us after the resurrection. After the judgment, God is going to give us these body parts back. But you are not going to get anything back because you're going to be destroyed. You're going to resurrect, but you're not going to go to, you're not going to, go to heaven. So this is how they were talking to him. And they were, they were teenagers, mere teenagers, one after the other. The bravery of these young people amazed everyone. But Antiochus was so arrogant 
But when he came to the last one, he was probably 11 years old, he thought, okay, now I'm just going to go to get, get his mother, bring his mother close, and maybe his mother is going to talk him out of doing the same foolishness as his brothers. And he was expecting his mother to say what? Oh, my son, you're my only one now. Stay with me. So I have somebody. That's what most mothers would say, but not this glorious woman called Solomon, who began to speak like a lioness. She began to speak like the most brave woman ever who said, listen to me, my child, have mercy on me. Don't you dare do anything different than, than your brothers. Remember, I carried you for nine months. Look at the, look at the stars. Look at, look at the sky. Look at everything. God created all these things and he created you and he's going to give you your body back. So do me a favor and do exactly as your brothers did. Remember, I breastfed you for three years. Listen to me. Don't let me down. What a glorious mother. And after this, this 11-year-old went to Antiochus and he said, I may be the youngest one, but the same father begot me, the same mother. I will do exactly as my brothers. And then he ran into the fire all by himself and died for the law of Moses. And then after this, their mother and of course, would she do any different than her sons? When the soldiers went to grab her, he said, no, I will not allow any one of you to touch me. And she ran into the fire all by herself. And she gave up her life for the law of Moses and for the commandments of God. And I said all these things because in the next 15 days, we are fasting. These young people died because they wanted to fast from pork. So for the next 15 days, our church is calling us to fast. It's a strict fast, but it's only 15 days. Weekends, we can have oil. So fasting is not something that was created from the priests. Fasting is the beginning, the beginning of self-control. St. Paul speaks about the fruits of the Holy Spirit in Philippians, and he starts from the very bottom, which is abstinence or self-control. When these young boys and girls fast, they develop self-control. They develop the willpower to say no to different things, to different challenges. That's why fasting is extremely important and the foundation of all virtues. Our traditions are very important. And these Maccabees, this small group of people who were called fanatics by many, and other different names. These are the people, just like the Colivades, who kept the tradition, who kept the faith. It's always the few that are going to keep the faith. So don't be afraid when people are calling us names. We will continue into the faith of our fathers. Amen. At this point, I would like to include the scriptural account of the martyrdom of the seven Maccabees and their mother, Solomonie. For when the tyrant was conspicuously defeated in his first attempt, being unable to compel an aged man, Eleazar, to eat defiling foods, then in violent rage he commanded that others of the Hebrew captives be brought and that any who ate defiling food should be freed after eating, but if any were to refuse, these should be tortured even more cruelly than the old teacher and priest Eleazar. When a tyrant had given these orders, seven brothers, handsome, modest, noble, and accomplished in every way, were brought before him along with their aged mother. When the tyrant saw them grouped about their mother as if in a chorus, he was pleased with them, and struck by their appearance and nobility, he smiled at them and summoned them close to him and said, Young men, I admire each and every one of you in a kindly manner and greatly respect the beauty and the number of such brothers. Not only do I advise you not to display the same madness as that of the old man who has just been tortured, but I also exhort you to submit to me and enjoy my friendship. Just as I'm able to punish those who disobey my orders, so I can be a benefactor to those who obey me. Trust me then, and you will have positions of authority in my government, if you will renounce the ancestral tradition of your national life, and enjoy your youth by adopting the Hellenistic way of life and by changing your manner of living. 
But if by disobedience you rouse my anger, you will compel me to destroy each and every one of you with dreadful punishments through tortures. Therefore, take pity on yourselves. Even I, your enemy, have compassion for your youth and handsome appearance. Will you not consider this, that if you disobey, nothing remains for you but to die on the rack? When he has said these things, he ordered the instruments of torture to be brought forward so as to persuade them out of fear to eat the defiling food. And when the guards had placed before them wheels and joint dislocators, rack and hooks and catapults and cauldrons and thumb screws and iron claws and wedges and bellows, the tyrant resumed speaking. Be afraid, young fellows, and whatever justice you revere, will be merciful to you when you transgress under compulsion. But when they had heard the inducements and saw the dreadful devices, not only were they not afraid, but they also opposed the tyrant with their own philosophy and by their right reasoning nullified his tyranny. Let us consider on the one hand what arguments might have been used if some of them had been cowardly and unmanly. Would they not have been these? O oh, wretches that we are, and so senseless, since the king has summoned and exhorted us to accept king treatment if we obey him, why do we take pleasure in vain resolves and venture upon a disobedience that brings death? O oh, men and brothers, should we not fear the instruments of torture and consider the threats of torments and give up this vain opinion and this arrogance that threatens to destroy us? Let us take pity on our youth and have compassion on our mother's age. And let us seriously consider that if we disobey, we are dead. Also, divine justice will excuse us for fearing the king when we are under compulsion. Why do we banish ourselves from this most pleasant life and deprive ourselves of this delightful world. Let us not struggle against compulsion, nor take hollow pride in being put to the rack. Not even the Lord itself would arbitrarily slay us for fearing the instruments of torture. Why does such contentiousness excite us, and such a fate of stubbornness please us, when we can live in peace if we obey the king? But the youths, though about to be tortured, neither said any of these things, nor even seriously considered them. For they were contemptuous of the emotions and suffering over agonies, so that as soon as the tyrant had ceased counseling them to eat defiling foods, all with one voice together, as from one mind, said, Why do you delay, your tyrant? For we are ready to die rather than transgress our ancestral commandments. We are obviously putting our forefathers to shame unless we should practice ready obedience to the law and to Moses, our counselor. Tyrant, and counselor of lawlessness. In your hatred for us, do not pity us more than we pity ourselves. For we consider this pity of yours, which ensures our safety through transgression of the law, to be more grievous than death itself. You are trying to terrify us by threatening us with death by torture, as though a short time ago you learned nothing from Eleazar. And if the aged men of the Hebrews, because of their religion, lived piously while enduring torture, it would be even more fitting that we young men should die despising your cursive tortures, which our aged instructor also overcame. Therefore, tyrant, put us to the test. And if you take our lives because of our religion, do not suppose that you can injure us by torturing us. For we, through this severe suffering and endurance, shall have the prize of virtue and shall be with God for whom we suffer. But you, because of your bloodthirstiness toward us, will deservedly undergo from the divine justice eternal torment by fire. When they had said these things, the tyrant not only was angry was at those who are disobedient, but also was enraged as at those who are ungrateful. Then at his command, the guards brought forward the eldest, and having torn off his tunic, 
they bound his hands and arms with thongs on each side. When they had worn themselves out, beaten him with scourges without accomplishing anything, they placed him upon the wheel. When the noble youth was stretched out around this, his limbs were dislocated, and though broken in every member, he denounced the tyrant, saying, Most abominable tyrant, enemy of heavenly justice, savage of mine, you are mangling me in this manner, not because I am a murderer or as one who acts impiously, but because I protect the divine law. And when the guard said, Agree to it so that you may be released from the tortures, he replied, You abominable lackeys, your will is not so powerful as to strangle my reason, cut my limbs, burn my flesh, and twist my joints. Through all these tortures, I will convince you that sons of the Hebrews alone are invincible where virtue is concerned. While he was saying these things, they spread fire under him, and while fanning the flames, they tightened the wheel farther. The wheel was completely smeared with blood, and the heap of coals was being quenched by the drippings of gore, and pieces of flesh were falling off the axles of the machine. Although the ligaments joining his bones were already severed, the courageous youth, worthy of Abraham, did not groan, but as though transformed by fire into immortality, he nobly endured the rackings. Imitate me, brothers, he said. Do not leave your post in my struggle or renounce our courageous brotherhood. Fight the sacred and noble battle for religion. Thereby the just providence of our ancestors may become merciful to our nation and take vengeance on the accursed tyrant. When he has said this, the saintly youth broke the thread of life. While all were marveling at his courageous spirit, the guards brought the next eldest and after fitting themselves with iron gauntlets having sharp hooks they bound him to the torture machine and catapult before torturing him they inquired if he were willing to eat and they heard this noble decision these leopard like beasts tore out his sinews with the iron hands flayed all his flesh up to his chin and tore away his scalp but he steadfastly endured this agony and said how sweet is any kind of death for the religion of our fathers to the tyrant he said do you not think you most savage tyrant that you are being tortured more than i as you see the arrogant design of your tyranny being defeated by our endurance for the sake of religion. I lighten my pain by the joys that come from virtue. But you suffer torture by the threats that come from impiety. You will not escape, most abominable tyrant, the judgments of the divine wrath. When he too had endured a glorious death, the third was let in, and many repeatedly urged him to save himself by tasting the meat. But he shouted, Do you not know that the same father begot me, and those who died, and the same mother bore me, and that I was brought up on the same teachings? I do not renounce the noble kinship that binds me to my brothers. And raged by the man's boldness, they disjointed his hands and feet with their instruments, dismembering him by prying his limbs from their sockets, and breaking his fingers and arms and legs and elbows. Since they were not able in any way to break his spirit, they abandoned the instruments and sculpted him with their fingernails in a Scythian fashion. They immediately brought him to the wheel, and while his vertebrae were being dislocated upon it, he saw his own flesh torn all around and drops of blood flowing from his entrails. When he was about to die, he said, We, most abominable tyrant, are suffering because of our godly training and virtue. But you, because of your impiety and bloodthirstiness, will undergo unceasing torments. When he also had died in a manner worthy of his brothers, they dragged in the fourth, saying, As for you, do not give way to the same insanity as your brothers, but obey the king and save yourself. But he said to them, You do not have a fire hot enough to make me play the coward. No, by the blessed death of my brothers, by the eternal destruction of the tyrant, and by the everlasting life of the pious, I will not renounce our noble brotherhood. Contrive tortures, tyrant, so that you may learn from them that I am a brother to those who have just been tortured. When he heard this, 
the bloodthirsty murderous and utterly abominable Antiochus gave orders to cut out his tongue. But he said, even if you remove my organ of speech, God hears also those who are mute. So here's my tongue, cut it off. For in spite of this, you will not make our reason speechless. Gladly, for the sake of God, we let our bodily members be mutilated. God will visit you swiftly, for you are cutting out a tongue that has been melodious with divine hymns. When this one died also, after being cruelly tortured, the fifth leaped up, saying, I will not refuse tyrant to be tortured for the sake of virtue. I have come of my own accord. By murdering me, you will incur punishment from the heavenly justice for even more crimes. Hater of virtue, hater of mankind, for what act of ours are you destroying us in this way? Is it because we revere the creator of all things? and live according to his virtuous law, but these deeds deserve honors, not tortures. While he was saying these things, the guards bound him and dragged him to the catapult. They tied him to it on his knees, and fitting iron clamps on them, they twisted his back around the wedge of the wheel, so that he was completely curled back like a scorpion, and all his members were disjointed. In this condition, gasping for breath, and in anguish of body, he said, Tyrant, they are splendid favors that you grant us against your will, because through these noble sufferings you give us an opportunity to show our endurance for the law. After he too had died, the sixth, a mere boy, was let in. When a tyrant inquired whether he was willing to eat and be released, he said, I am a younger in age than my brothers but I am their equal in mind. Since to this end we were born and bred, we ought likewise to die for the same principles. So if you intend to torture me for not eating defiled foods, go on torturing. When he had said this, they led him to the wheel. He was carefully stretched tight upon it. His back was broken and he was roasted from underneath. To his back they applied sharp spits that had been heated in the fire and pierced his ribs so that his entrails were burned through. While being tortured, he said, O contest befitting holiness, in which so many of us brothers have been summoned to an arena of sufferings for religion, and in which we have not been defeated. For religious knowledge, O tyrant, is invincible. I also, equipped with nobility, will die with my brothers, and I myself will bring a great avenger upon you, you inventor of tortures, an enemy of those who are truly devout. We six boys have paralyzed your tyranny, since you have not been able to persuade us to change our mind or to force us to eat defiling foods. Is not this your downfall? Your fire is cold to us, and the catapults painless, and your violence powerless. For it is not the guards of the tyrant, but those of the divine law that are set over us. Therefore, unconquered, we hold fast to reason. When he also, thrown into the cauldron, had died a blessed death, the seventh and youngest of all came forward. Even though the tyrant has been fearfully reproached by the brothers, he felt strong compassion for this child when he saw that he was already in fetters. He summoned him to come nearer and try to console him, saying, You see the result of your brother's stupidity, for they died in torments because of their disobedience. You too, if you do not obey, will be miserably tortured and die before your time. But if you yield to persuasion, you will be my friend and a leader in the government of the kingdom. When he had so pleaded, he sent for the boy's mother to show compassion on her, who had been bereaved of so many sons, and to influence her to persuade the surviving son to obey and save himself. But when his mother had exhorted him in the Hebrew language, as we shall tell a little later, he said, Let me loose, let me speak to the king and to all his friends that are with him. Extremely pleased by the boy's declaration, they freed him at once. He said, You profane tyrant! most impious of all the wicked, since you have received good things and also your kingdom from God. Were you not ashamed to murder his servants and torture on the wheel those who practice religion? Because of this, 
justice has laid up for you intense and eternal fire and torturers, and these throughout all time will never let you go. As a man, you are not ashamed, you most savage beast, to cut out the tongues of men who have feelings like yours, and are made of the same elements as you, and to maltreat and torture them in this way. Surely they, by dying nobly, fulfill their service to God, but you will wail bitterly for having slain without cause the contestants for virtue. Then because he too was about to die, he said, I do not desert the excellent example of my brothers, and I call on the God of our fathers to be merciful to our nation, but on you he will take vengeance both in this present life and when you are dead. After he had uttered these imprecations, he flung himself into the braziers and so ended his life. And just a few verses about the great mother of these seven martyrs, seven Maccabees. Her name is Solomoni, a mother worthy of the glory of God. These are some of the words of, of their coach, their own mother, who was standing by the side lines asking them not to dishonor her by showing a defeatist mentality. And she says, It is unreasonable for people who have religious knowledge not to withstand pain. By these words, the mother of the seven encouraged and persuaded each of her sons to die rather than violate God's commandment. They knew also that those who die for the sake of God live in God, as do Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the patriarchs. Some of the guards said that when she also was about to be seized and put to death, she threw herself into the flames so that no one might touch her body. O oh, mother, who with your seven sons nullified the violence of the tyrant, frustrated his evil designs, and showed the courage of your faith. Nobly set like a roof on the pillars of your sons, you held firm and unswerving against the earthquake of the torture. Take courage, therefore, O holy-minded mother, maintaining firm and enduring hope in God. The moon in heaven with the stars does not stand so august as you, who after lightening the way of your star-like seven sons to piety, stand in honor before God and are firmly set in heaven with them. For your children were true descendants of Father Abraham. Whoa.